good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon what time you are watching our review. I've missed you guys this week. Last week was amazing. The presence of the Lord just came right in and he had his way with us. And we love it when he does that. Praise and worship, you guys were phenomenal. Uh, the music was awesome. Our worship was great. I believe the Lord was truly pleased with us. And I think so because the word he gave to each of us specifically was so, so exact that only our God could do something like that. So let's go ahead and start reviewing what we discussed on last week. So if you weren't here last week, here's your review. I'll tell you what your next week, what this week's homework assignment is for this upcoming Saturday. So you can get your notebooks out, get your pens, and get ready to, uh, to catch up with us. You haven't missed much, so don't worry. I know a lot of you are sending me texts of panic, like I've missed so much, I need to know what's happening. Uh, but just go back over all the reviews uh, that you'll find on our website at RenewWorshipCenter.org and you'll see every review from every week that we've done thus far. And that might help uh, catch you back up. But truthfully, the main reviews you have to look at, even if you are a subscriber to our YouTube page, are the Abraham uh, reviews. That's Abraham 1, 2, and 3. And this would make Abraham 4. So you can go back through all of those reviews and get caught up on the story of Abram and Abraham, which is where we are right now. And last week, the presence of God was amazing. And God is challenging our faith. On last week, you know that we discussed in more detail, and it's worth repeating, that the view that God has of faith always has two parts. The first part, for him, for God's view of faith is not merely believing, but what God counts as faith, as we said before, is what he says and our actions based upon the belief of what he says. Now that covers two areas. That tells us, like we discussed, you have to hear it again, that God's view of faith is not just merely believing, but God's view of faith is that we, how we act based upon what it is we believe that he said. So the first part is our actions, and the second part is indicative of faith, and that's do we know that God said it? Now this is huge, this is so big, because this pretty much takes the whole name it, claim it scenario out of the water, all right? It blows up everything that we think we say God said, and it challenges us to come to a point of saying, did God say it to you? Now you can say that anything his word says, he probably is saying to you, he could very well say it to you, but in truth, you have to know if God is declaring that thing for your life. Now, I know a lot of you are, are feeling very challenged at this point because I like to be able to say that every promise in the word of God is a promise of mine. And this could be true, but it's only true to a certain extent. There are some curses in the Bible. and you, Clearly, you don't want to claim any of those. And these are things that God stated. So what we have to know is that what God says and what he is saying is strategic. There are times that God, God will tell you to move, and there are times he'll tell you to stand still. There are times that he'll tell you to pray, and there are times that he'll tell you to fight. And what he says, because his word is living, has a lot to do with what you believe. So just because he stated it at any point in his word does not necessarily mean he's saying it to you right now. It does mean that he could be saying it. Are you catching what I'm saying? Because this then means that now in order to believe that God is saying something to you and to have the God type of faith that he loves, you have to have relationship with God in order to know what he's saying to you about you at this time. This means that last year is what he said last year. Even if it has not been accomplished, you need him to say it again this year. That's why the Bible says, uh, once God spoke, but twice I heard that power belongs to God. Because even if he said it then, are you still hearing it today? If you're not still hearing it today, then that then is now then. And now you have to move in what's today. Sometimes God gives us promises that are conditional. And you'll see a lot of covenants in the Old Testament are conditional promises. So did what he promised, was what he promised you conditional? Was it based on this season or this time in your life? You know, claiming it now, is he still saying it now? Because if he's not still saying it and you're yet believing for it, then you're believing in the past. That's why the story with Abram is so uh, true and it's so um, reflective of our journeys in Christ. Because Abram was constantly affirmed and reaffirmed by the Lord that this land I'm going to give you, that your descendants will come. At every strategic point of Abram's
pilgrim's journey at points where something dramatically changed, whether his location changed, whether the individuals that were traveling with him changed. Every time there was a major change that could affect the promise of God, God spoke the promise again. That's huge. Because this meant that Abram had to be in an active relationship with God. From Genesis chapter 11, 12, and 13, Abram had to consistently build an altar and call on the name of the Lord. Talk to him again. Go back to this point. Build another altar. Call on the name of the Lord. He had to consistently check to make sure that at this stage and this season, God is still going to fulfill what he stated. So that means that you and I have the same responsibility. That we just don't stand on promises blindly without any relationship with God. But at every point in our lives that change happens where, where that promise could be affected that we have to seek God all over again. Now I know some of you are getting exhausted and tired and because you, this sounds daunting. You would much prefer just to name it and claim it and have lazy kind of faith that just says, oh God, if he wants to do it, he'll do it. But lazy faith is not God faith because God's view of faith comes with action and it's action based off of what he says. So on last week, we talked in detail about Abram's movement and we looked more specifically uh, regarding the time from when you remember we discussed on last week how Abram went to Egypt because there was a famine in the land as he was traveling to the land of Canaan. And we looked at on last week that here Abram was not 100% honest. He told Pharaoh, at the, at the fear of death, uh, that Sarah, my wife, or Sarai, is actually my sister. And technically, she was his stepsister. Uh, but more specifically, he was not 100% honest. He was deceptive. And because he was deceptive and Pharaoh was going to sleep with his wife, which would make uh, Abram's household curse, that God sent a plague to Pharaoh's household because God told Abram, uh, every person that curses you, I will curse, and everyone that blesses you, I will bless. And so we found this to be strange that it was Pharaoh that God brought a curse to his household. Why? Because Pharaoh was planning something that would bring a curse to Abram. So this is the responsibility of Christians, that our lives are lived with integrity, knowing that the decisions and actions we make could inadvertently affect those that are connected to us. So Abram began his journey leaving Egypt and Pharaoh sent him out. Once the curse happened, Pharaoh came to him and said, what are you doing to me? Why did you tell me that this was your, your, your sister when in actuality she's your wife? Why didn't you let me know beforehand? Because I almost slept with her, almost took her as my own. Now you get out and take everything that I've given you with you. And we talked on last week that here Abram had an opportunity to leave, but he left Pharaoh's household with goods silver and gold and livestock because Pharaoh was trying to smooch up to Abram because he thought that he was Sarah's sister and it would give him favor with her and he was allowed to leave Abram was allowed to leave Egypt with those goods oh this is challenging because you and I we like to see God as being clear-cut you do wrong you get wrong back to you you do good you get good back to you and it shouldn't be any blurred lines but now let's be honest there are times that you and I know by the mercy of God that we have not operated with the best of integrity or the best of intentions and somehow despite our own selves God chose to bless us. So Abram had the benefit of that that despite his 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 insecurity despite his indiscretion despite him being a tad bit deceitful God still blessed him. So Abram traveled with his family, Sarah and Lot, and all that they had, and they continued to journey. And Abram went back to the place that he started uh, and built an altar before the Lord, and that was between the, uh, Bethel and the city called Ai, or Ai. Now uh, that's strategic, as we discussed on last week, because Bethel, uh, in Hebrew, actually means uh, the house of God, whereas Ai means a heap of ruins. And so Abram was nestled in between the house of God and a heap of ruins. And any time you find yourself between what God, where God is and where you came from, that means you're in a time of transition. And so Abram was sitting in a, in a point of transition and decision making. Which direction am I going to go in God? And he decides that he's going to continue to move forward. So he builds an altar to the Lord, calls on the name of the Father, and continues to move. And as he moves, he comes to a nice place where he and his uh, nephew Lot encamp. And here we discover the story of Lot, and we delve a little bit more in detail that Lot 
according to uh, Genesis chapter 13, that Lot's possessions had increased as well as Abram's and that the land, according to scripture, could not support them. So as you know the story, Lot comes to Abram and says, look, our herdsmen are fighting. What are we going to do? And so Abram says to him, listen, you go your way, whatever way you choose, I'll go the opposite way. If you go east, I'll go west. If you go left, I'll go right. You just choose it. Now, we discussed on last week that what you're really seeing here in actuality is a slap in the face. Here, Lot was under the wing and the arms and the care of Abram since he was a child. When Lot's own father, Haran, had died, Abram took him under his wing. He led him through the city, he heard through the cities and through their journey to the promised land. Everything Abram was encountering, Lot was there to see that God was making promises and covenants of future land that will be Abram's. And when they went down to Egypt, Lot was there. And when, and when they came out of Egypt with all these possessions, Lot was there. And now that Lot has all this wealth and accumulated so many great things, now all of a sudden you want to tell Abram, listen, your people and my people are fighting. Now what are we going to do? Now that was a slap in the face. Think about how many people you've helped them get to where they are. Think about your coworkers and your family and friends that if it had not been for your influence in their life, they would probably not be nearly as blessed or as successful as where they are right now. And then you all and I, you and I, we all have felt that hurt when you've helped someone and you've seen progress in their life and they come and they slap you in the face and say, you know what, I don't need your help anymore, I'm gone. But the truth of the matter is Lot was like an adopted son to Abram. And he Lot would not have had what he had had it not been for Abram. So to show loyalty or gratitude, at least Lot could have said, Uncle, Abram, listen, our herdsmen are fighting. Whatever you say my herdsmen need to do, that's what we're going to do. But no, instead he was ready to go. He was ready to leave. He would forfeit the promises that God was giving Abram for an opportunity to be on his own. Did you hear that? That Lot was willing to forfeit. God had promised Abram that your family will bless families on the earth and generation after generation. And I'm going to give you all this land. And Lot was willing to forfeit all of that in order to state claim that he has arrived on his own. So here's a warning that God gives us in this example. That none of us arrive any place on our own. That it was always significant. There was always someone in our lives that helped us to get to where we are. Whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in ministry, in churches, whether it's your grandmother that prayed for you to get to know God, someone helped us to get to where we are. And because of that, our loyalty should remain. And there should, that we should be the ones that strive for peace for the individuals that helped us to get to where we are. We all have to be mindful of our fathers and mothers in the Lord that have paved the ways and the roads and the paths that we're now riding on and, and now the shoulders that we're now standing on. These people deserve a round of applause in our hearts and loyalty in our prayers. So, as you know, the story goes a lot separated from Abram and we're going to have to come to a close on our review, but you've got to read Gen chapter 13 in Genesis again for yourself. Because when Abram, when, when Lot chose to leave, he chose a journey toward the east, which is where Sodom and Gomorrah was. Also, the east was in the direction of the city Ai, uh, which also, or I, which also represents a heap of ruins. So, a, uh, so Lot was really choosing to go towards a heap of ruins on the east rather, the house of, rather than the house of God, which was Bethel on the west. And I believe today that the only reason Lot, as we discussed on last week, the only reason Lot could not identify that he was headed towards a heap of ruins and all he saw was how green and luscious it was and it reminded him of Egypt according to scripture and it reminded him of the Garden of Eden. These are all places of fallen sin and danger. But the reason Lot could not see any of that danger is because he was already out of place in his heart. He could have been a benefactor in the household of Abram. He could have been a benefactor in growing in the kingdom of God but he'd rather try his own and take his inheritance and leave. So the scripture tells us that as Abram traveled east, first he stayed in the plains on the east, then the scripture says, then he got even as far as Sodom. And the King James Version of Genesis, I think it is chapter 13, says, verse 12 says that Lot even pitched his tent toward Sodom and Gomorrah. Now you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we're gonna look at that on next week. So hint, that is your homework to go into detail in the story of uh, 
Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 14, but we find that Lot got ever closer to Sodom and Gomorrah until finally in chapter 14, he's in it. First, he started heading in that direction. Then he started in the plains of that city and in the cities closest to Sodom and Gomorrah. And before you knew it, he's right at the edge of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the scripture says that he had pitched his tent. King James says he pitched his tent facing Sodom and Gomorrah. That's huge. Because we discussed on last week that whatever your tent is facing, that's the thing that you really desire. What you see when you wake up and when you go to bed, that's really where your heart is. For example, if you pitch your tent, and for those of us that went on the camping trip a couple weeks ago, you know exactly what I mean. Wherever your door is facing, that's the first thing you're going to see when you wake up, and it's the last thing you're going to see before you go to bed. So this is key because on last week we discussed how important it is for us as, as believers to make sure that the first thing we see when we wake up in the morning before you even greet your spouse and hug and kiss and smoochies with all the, the morning breath and before you get up and start checking your emails and grabbing your devices and going through your list today, that the first thing that you should be pitching, pitching your tent facing is God. And the last thing that you should pitch your tent facing is not scandal. It's not all the other movies, marry something, marry, I don't know. You know all the movies, all the shows, you know. You're, the last thing your tent should be facing is not television or some song that is not godly, but the last thing that your, your tent should be facing is Christ. Because if he's the first thing you see when you wake up and the last thing you're thinking about when you're going to bed, then at least you're showing your desire for him. Because you know the story of Lot, because his tent was facing Sodom and Gomorrah, he was always seeing it, always desiring it, and it wasn't but a matter of time before he was there. So there's your homework. Chapter 14. Go into detail. There's a huge war that happens in chapter 14. And before you know it, we'll be back in Genesis chapter 15, which is where we started on this journey of faith with Abram. So do Genesis chapter 14 in detail. Study who is fighting and why they're fighting because that's what we're going to look at on next week. So if you want some hints to all of our overachievers, look at the cities and the kings very carefully and come back ready to discuss why you think those kings and kingdoms were significant. So as a heads up, you're going to be in group discussion next week. That means you're going to open up and you're going to start discussing what you've read and what you've studied. So come prepared. I know you're excited. You guys are just bubbling over right now. I can tell. So go ahead, start studying in detail chapter 14. Use the Strong's Concordance. Dust it off, blow the dust off of it. If you don't know what it is, text me, I'll tell you. You can find it online. Start diving into some of those names and words and kingdoms. Come back with some history. You know who, my, who the studiers are, all of you. As I'm learning, you guys are getting hungry and that's great. So get ready, dive into that war, dive into that battle and come prepared on Saturday at seven to start off in discussion about what you've studied. I love you guys. I can't wait to see you on Saturday and have a wonderful week.